joining us this afternoon for the fifth lecture in the IGERT seminar series uh, through the IGERT program on ocean change. This is the second year that we've held this student curated series. IGERT is the Interdisciplinary Graduate Student Education and Research Traineeship. It's funded by the National Science Foundation. It's supported also by the College of the Environment. IPOC brings together graduate students and faculty from various fields, all of whom share a common interest in the Interdisciplinary Study of Ocean Change. For more information about the IPOC program, you can visit our website, which is on our slide up here. This lecture series is made possible by the support of both the College of the Environment and the Joint Institute of the Atmosphere and the Ocean, uh, Jaseo. So we thank you guys for your continued support. We encourage you today to live tweet using the hashtag IPOC 2014, and in the coming weeks, or I should really say just next week, we invite you to join us for the final lecture in our series, which will be Dr. Ray Kilborn, Same Place and Time. Next. Thank you. So today we are pleased to introduce uh, Lighthouser Endowed, Endowed Professor in Environmental Policy, Ann Bostrom. Ann joined the University of Washington's Evans School of Public Affairs in 2007 after serving as the Associate Dean for Research at the Ivan Allen College of Liberal Arts and as a professor in the School of Public Policy at Georgia Tech. Bostrom co-directed the Decision Risk and Management Science Program at the National Science Foundation from 1999 through 2001. While in this position, she organized, participated in, and made presentations at national and international meetings uh, on research and science policy including but not limited to the Subcommittee on National Disaster Reduction and the National Earthquake Hazard and Reduction Program. She has authored or contributed to numerous public publications, including Risk Communication, a Mental Models Approach from 2002, Risk Assessment, Modeling and Decision Support, Strategic Directions from 2008, in addition to reports for the National Research Council, the Institute of Medicine, the U.S. EPA Science Advisory Board, and the U.S. EPA Board of Scientific Counselors. She earned her BA here at the UW in English and went on to earn her MBA at Western Washington and her PhD in public policy analysis from Carnegie Mellon. In addition, she has completed postdoctoral studies in both in engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon and in cognitive aspects of survey methodology at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. As of last year, she was named a fellow of AAAS and her areas of specialization include environmental management, environmental policy, risk communication, and risk perception. Today, today, Anne's talk is entitled Ocean Change Information for Action. Please join me in, wel in welcoming Professor Boston. I appreciate the introduction and thank you all for coming. Um, I, the last speaker in the series had a number of cartoons that came with mixed reception. So I thought I would start with a couple of jokes instead. <laughs> And I made them up especially for the occasion, so they're terrible. Um, so, what do pirates and sopranos have in common? Yes, they like sailing on the high seas. <laughs> okay, now, what do Captain Ahab and Maria Callas have in common? Whaling on the high seas. <laughs> okay, that was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, it, it can only go downhill, right? <laughs> so, okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, proactive information strategies and I'll give you a one, two, three. Um, so I'll try to stay focused on the first, um, the rapid rise of ocean acidification as an example of um, what's going on with ocean change, especially in Washington State. Um, and it's, it's, I should say, maybe the rapid fall. Um, and uh, ocean acidification is in some sense a poster child for how things might go right at the state level. Washington has certainly been in the lead, and we have people in the audience here, Terry Klinger and others, who've um, played very important roles in bringing ocean acidification to the attention of the state legislature and others, um, the, uh, the governor and so forth. So I'll talk about that a little. Um, then I'm going to talk about desiderata for decision support in the context of ocean change. And uh, third, I will cover 
um, what I call practical theories, an illustration from oil spill response communications research that some of you in the audience have participated in with me over the last year to attempt to help in oil spill response. So let me start with ocean acidification. And um, if I'm going way too fast, just wave your hands. Um, okay. So first I'm going to start with um, where we are in terms of public awareness of ocean acidification. I did a really what I would call a cheap shot shirt search on the Access Global News um, database that's available through the library at the University of Washington. And this is a database that covers all kinds of media outlets and publications around the world. So it has uh, thousands of sources. Um, and I'm going to show you two things. Um, in the solid line, the reports from all sources except me, uh, video and audio uh, news sources, and then from newspapers in the dotted blue line. And this is from 1998 through 2013, but I did not time constrain the search, so this is everything that appeared uh, when I did this really cheap shot search. And so what you can see is that there have been an incredible rise in uh, news about ocean acidification just over the last less than 10 years, so to speak. Um, and that's continuing to go up. Some people attribute the, the first notice, uh, social notice of ocean acidification to a UK Royal Society report that was issued in 2005. The first request from the US Congress for action, specifically on ocean acidification, appeared in legislation reauthorizing the primary law governing marine fisheries. Uh, management in federal waters of the U.S., and that was in 2006, so very soon thereafter, led, of course, by Representative Jay Inslee, um, who is now uh, plays a different role. He, he led a bipartisan effort to add the provision to the House version of the bill. So, um, and that comes from a report by Laura Levison that's been out. More recently, we've had a National Academies, Academies report in 2010 that proposed a national strategy for ocean acidification that I will talk about a little bit more later. So. Re rising in the news and rising on the policy front. Um, this, you guys have probably done yourself as well. Has anybody done a Google Trends search? No? Ah, well, Bob, of course. <laughs> okay, so Google Trends, um, this is, Google has a lot of tools that you can use, and I'm going to talk about another tool from Google uh, later on in the report, in the uh, presentation. But Google has this thing called Google Trends that they started working with to look at influenza. Um, they felt that they could probably predict um, trends in influenza uh, faster than the CDC could by looking at people's searches for influenza medications and things like that, me um, treatments and flu treatments and symptoms and uh, stuff like that. So they developed this trends tool that basically does that. And then they matched, then they competed with CDC, they collaborated with CDC to see whether CDC's predictions and, and estimations of trends came out um, as well or as fast as Google. And so Google is actually faster than the CDC in its, in, in its formal reporting. And this is a really important um, uh, prediction device because it helps prepare uh, for flu, st influenza, in flu vaccination strategies and response um, preparation for hospitals and that kind of thing. So they're, they're always on the look for pandemics and this is one of those tools that can help them do it. So anyway, what I've done here is I've just looked also um, at another cheap shot which is ocean acidification. Google Trends is a smart tool so it actually looks for um, analogs and so it doesn't show it here but it looks for similar terms like that too. And um, this is just in the news. You can select whether it looks at all searches or just news searches and this is just news searches. And I don't know if you can see it here but at the top, um, at the top here, is this working? It looks like it's not working. It's not working. Okay, so at the top here, uh, there's a little box that says ocean acidification worst in 300 million years, and that's the headline number C. So it gives you access to all the raw data that was that were found in the searches, um, at least some of them when you look at it this way. And you can see here a very similar rise starting here around 2006 and going up, up, up um, to 2013. Not as rapid as the um, the other rise, but still a quite rapid rise in interest. So it shows that it's getting on um, the radar. But you can see here globally that ocean acidification is of concern to who? Well, I searched in English, so that's a limitation. But nevertheless, it's um, primarily uh, the US and Australia who are at the top of the list. So there has been a little bit of research on public opinion and public awareness. Um, this is from a 2010 study that Tony Lizerowitz did. Um, he was looking. Tony is a head of the Climate Change Communications Group at Yale, and they do regular surveys on public opinion and public attitudes towards climate change. And in 2010, he did something a little bit different for them, which he looked at knowledge and understanding of climate change. And they included several questions 
about ocean acidification. So in this, um, this question, uh, this is a sample of 2000 that 20, 2030 who are representative of the national adult population of the United States. Um, and he asked, how much, if anything, have you read or heard about ocean acidification? And you can see here the numbers in parentheses. A lot, only 1%. A little, 18%. Nothing, 77%. So it's really not on the public radar in any sense to speak of. So those who answered something other than nothing were asked a follow-up question, um, and that was, which of the following causes ocean acidification? And you can see that only a third of those who said they'd read a lot um, something about ocean acidification said that it was due to absorption of carbon dioxide by, um, by the ocean. And there were several other options here, um, all of which got some adherence. So we have chemical spills in the ocean, acid rain, warmer ocean temperatures, and a fifth of the respondents saying they just don't know. So it's a very um, mixed picture about public awareness. Now, for the um, Blue Ribbon panel in Washington, uh, some of you may have seen this slide before, I would suspect. But um, it was made in a presentation, um, I think, to the state legislature. But this is research that was done by EDGE Research on the Ocean Conservancy in collaboration. I um, was not able to see. Um, what the source was, but it looks like it's all focus groups. Um, they must have asked individual focus groups responses to these questions too. But um, this is an example of a question that asked people to prioritize problems. So they give them a list of problems and they said, we are asking about the world's oceans overall. How serious a threat to the health of the oceans are each of the following? And then they list these things. And so what you can see is the proportion who said that these were among the most serious or very serious. And this is the percentage. And at the top is dumping of sewage chemicals and other pollutants. And uh, finally down here, um, at about 50% is ocean acidification along with global warming, which is 51%. Um, so way less concern. By the way, if you're interested in, in uh, fisheries, they get a little more attention. Um, and there's some con there's higher concern about um, damage to loss and lo and loss of ocean and coastal habitats and overfishing and depletion of fish populations. So it's, um, that said, people have a tendency when they get questions like this to say that things are bad. So there's a, a, a compliance um, uh, bias in how people respond to these kinds of questions. And as I mentioned, um, Washington State is in the lead in some sense, some states, on ocean acidification. And this comes from the Washington State Ocean Acidification Information Strategies and Key Actions listed in the report. And I just picked out a couple here to illustrate that science communication and information are among the key strategies that are regarded as um, key early actions or urgent and should have priority for something that the state addresses right away. Um, so strategy 8.1 is established that ocean acidification is a real and recognized problem in Washington state that requires action now. Um, and then they have these actions that go with each strategy. And you can see that the first one is about developing and communicating key messages for use by the various parties who may act as ambassadors on ocean acidification. Um, and then we have increasing understanding of ocean acidification among key stakeholders as um, the second action here, also considered a key action. So um, among the policy strategies here, or um, among the key policy strategies recommended is an information strategy. So um, that's fine, but um, information for what? And so the, the Washington State strategy here is focusing primarily on awareness. They do have other elements of their strategy that focus on working with communities and stakeholders to develop decision support. Um, and that was a key element of the National Academies report that I mentioned earlier. It said, um, and they noted in their report that because ocean acidification is a relatively new concern, and research results are just now emerging, it will be even more challenging to move from science to decision support. So how do you translate the science into decision support? Um, and it's really important. So the next um, thing I'm going to talk about here is decision support and how we can think about it. In the National Academies report, um, they refer to uh, an earlier National Academies report that's uh, on climate change, informing decisions in a changing climate in 2009. And this was part of a set of studies. How many of you have read these? Or one of them? Huh. Very small number. OK. Well, there's probably something in them related to oceans. I think, actually, I don't. I, I did some searches on some other things that I'm familiar with on climate change to see how much oceans were mentioned, and it wasn't as much as I thought. <laughs> so it's been kind of neglected. But um, this uh, this is one of a set of reports that came out um, trying to look at decision support 
um, for action on climate change. And in these six principles, the first is to begin with users' needs, identify through two-way communication between knowledge producers, that's you guys, right? Some of you. And uh, decision makers, that's also some of you guys. So, and sometimes these lines get blurred. Give priority to process. Now this is, this can be difficult for people. Um, Two-way communication with users um, over products, um, for example, data, maps, projections, tools, and models, to ensure that useful products are created. It is very easy to barge ahead with products without understanding how to design them. And messages are a kind of product that are most commonly referred to in this context. Link information producers and users, build connections across disciplines and organizations, seek institutional stability for longevity and effectiveness, that means money. So. That's a little difficult in these, um, this current environment, um, but they were um, cognizant of the fact that, the fact that you really want to develop, develop something that will endure for the long run. And design for learning from experience, flexibility, and adaptability. So that means building in mechanisms to help you learn from what you're doing and, um, and using them, um, thinking about the information that you're getting from those and changing what you're doing as appropriate. So another way of looking at it, so that's decision support. Um, a key part of decision support, uh, you could argue, um, is science communication. And that comes through in the six principles that they cite there. And um, we have a framework, um, my colleagues and I have been working, as many of you know, for decades now on a framework for um, what we call risk communication, but um, science communication more generally now, um, that we've developed as a mental models approach to risk communication. And um, there have been two colloquia now um, at the National Academies in the last two years. Um, called the Sackler Colloquia on the Science of Science Communication. And they are, um, all the materials from those colloquia are available online. So you can watch the videos, you can uh, look at the presentations. Um, and there is now a special issue out from the first uh, Sackler Colloquium in the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science, which came out, I believe, in September of uh, last year. And there are three, um, Brooke Fischhoff was one of the co-organizers of these colloquia. And uh, there are three steps that he sees as key in designing science communication. And the first, a formal decision analysis framework and expertise. So he talks about the importance of involving decision sciences and thinking about the goals of your information, of supporting people and decisions. If we think about ocean change, supporting them in decisions that will help them protect and remediate problems in the ocean. Um, so creating actionable information, information that's actually useful, that you can do something with. Um, but this all depends on which decisions you're looking at, of course. So you need to start with decision makers. And um, I was at a presentation this weekend where uh, we were talking about participative design of things. And, and we were talking about how important it is to ask people what they need and what they want. And, and uh, Granger Morgan, who is a collaborator on this work, jumped up and he held up his iPhone, which I don't have. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but we didn't know we needed these 15 years ago. So it is, of course, true that you can change people's thinking, causal thinking about what's going on, and hence their beliefs in what they need or want, um, ultimately, as well. Um, that said, um, beware, right? So that's a kind of a persuasive strategy. Now, marketers do that all the time, and Edge Research is a marketing, is a marketing company. The people who had uh, done that early public opinion research on ocean acidification that was presented to Washington State. So marketing research runs on the same principles as a lot of communication research, but its goals are often quite different. They're persuasive rather than informative or um, supportive. And um, it's a fine line, and recipients of messages are very highly attuned to what the aims of the message are. So. Okay, so the second part is the state of the arts ocean sciences. So we need not only decision analysis, but we need the emerging sciences like yours. I mean, that's incredibly important. Research and expertise shows that it's not easy to get. You need people that have at least a decade in the field. Um, Kay Anders Erickson has done a whole lot of work with expertise across a wide range of topics and shown that you need about 10,000 hours before you really have a good grasp of the topic that you're looking at. And that holds for like piano playing and sports and different fields of science. Um, and it's also important to recognize, as you undoubtedly do, that scientists, even in the same general domain, let's say you're all looking at ocean change, have very different expertise, right? So I heard from some of the, some of you yesterday about what you're doing, and you're looking some um, 
I heard a story about looking at metals in the ocean, for example, um, and then broadening that to include thinking about the role of metals in e um, ecological uh, cycles and ecosystems. That's a whole, adding a whole other range of expertise. So these days, a lot of people do look at the, inter the crossings between two disciplines, but it's very difficult and time consuming, um, and it requires a lot of dedication to do even that. The third part is social and behavioral sciences. And this, um, I'm going to talk about two parts of this. Um, there's a lot that social behavioral and behavioral sciences can do. Policy sciences are included among social and behavioral sciences. Um, and you've heard some about policy. In fact, you've heard a lot about policy in here, apparently. So I won't talk too much about that. But um, you can analyze incentive structures. You can look at, at, at um, regulatory processes, um, for example. But um, social and behavioral sciences include everything from evaluating how people think about something, how they understand it, to um, how you run surveys to get, um, to get at um, responses to information. So we um, I came up with a shortcut summary of this approach in, in our work called um, Assessing What to Address with Mental Models Research. And this is published in um, the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science in September if you want to look at it. And it has basically four steps. Identifying what people know. Um, and so that means looking uh, excuse me, what people need to know to make an informed decision. So this is looking at what science can tell you that's going to help you make a better decision. And then identifying what people already know. So this is going to look at users um, and uh, their decision models and how they make decisions. The third is uh, designing communications um, and the content of those and then using the best uh, comparisons of those two that you can use with social decision sciences to assess those and then finally testing those empirically. So now I'm going to move to um, a practical example, and I'll show you some research results that I think are relevant by analogy. It's certainly in an ocean context. It's not in the ocean context most of you are looking in, but there are, uh, um, Tom and Bob certainly are. So, so um, this is a multidisciplinary project team. Um, it includes a practitioner, Anne Hayward Walker, who's been working in the field of oil response for over 30 years. She's the president of Scientific Environmental Associates um, Consulting Group. Um, myself. Tom Lachine um, here at the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs, Bob Pavia, who's also affiliated with the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs, and then Kate Starbird, who some of you may know, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Human Centered Design and Engineering. And um, so I'm going to show a little bit of re research that they've done, but focus mostly on the part that I was laid on. So the context here is oil spill response, and I don't know if any of you have seen this picture. Is that ringing a bell? Um, so it's deep water. Um, and so what's going on here? It's kind of fuzzy. But, um, it's an airplane spraying dispersants on the spill. And anybody who was involved in the spill, and anybody who was reading the headlines, um, may have uh, may realize that there was a lot of contention in the communities, communities along the Gulf about the use of dispersants. There was a lot of people upset. They were worried about health effects. They worried about what the plans were. They, they wanted to know what the ingredients were. They felt like information was being suppressed. There was um, a lot of, um, of back and forth about the, the chemical dispersant use in particular. So in this project, um, we were looking at trying to design communications to address these kinds of concerns, among other things. And we'd asked, we were asked specifically by NOAA to address these in this project. Um, but we decided to put it um, in a larger oil spill response context. And, um, this is an example of the kind of stimulus that we use to try to get at this first step, sort of the science of oil spill response and what about um, what we know from scientific information that can be useful in response in particular. So this is a scenario I think, um, that uh, some of you know very well that talks about the fate and transport of oil. And um, you can see that there, for those of you who are not familiar, there are a lot of different processes here from emulsification to dissolution and dispersion sedimentation and biodegradation. And so those of you who are interested in ecosystems, some of these processes are very important. Like, um, and you know that the rates at which these processes occur and the degree to which um, dispersant use affects them may change um, exposures, for example, of benthic systems or of ecosystems, uh, uh, elements of ecosystems to um, oil and to uh, dispersants, but in particular to oil. Um, so what we were looking at here is whether people under, what, they, what they could tell us about fate and transport, whether people's um, be beliefs about these agreed. And here we're looking at experts. So we're talking to people who have been in oil spill response for 10, 15, 20, 
30 years. Um, uh, many of them among the most senior scientists in the field. Um, and the report, uh, the uh, workshop that we held to update our model uh, was held here at NOAA um, on Sandpoint in August two, um, 2012. We developed the model initially in the late 90s and um, revised it based on new science in this August 2012 workshop. So you can see how we could get at percentages of evaporation and, and dis, um, dissolution, for example, and then we could also look at contingencies between them, what happens when you throw something into the mix, like you've cleaned some of it, cleaned some of it up with mechanical booms and skimmers, or you've thrown some dispersant on it, what would happen, right? Um, okay, so here's the model. It's really simple, so I'll skip that. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, it's impossible to read. So. Um, it, there's about 200 different things in it, and this is a top view of the model. And you can see that it, it, um, what's in here is probably embedded in here is probably more interesting to you than the top view. But this is a sort of a decision framework for thinking about choosing response options in an oil spill. Um, so you have to think about time. The, um, so how long it's been since the spill. Um, uh, uh, physical and environmental conditions. Do you have high waves or not? Um, is are the rough seas initial oil characteristics and source? Is it underwater? Is it um, is it a ship? Uh, where is it coming from? Um, how uh, how dense is it? What's uh, how uh, what characteristics does it does it have? What fate wh about the fate and transport processes that we just looked at? How high are the winds and what's going on with um, sedimentation, for example. And then logistics turns out to be really important. In the late 90s, we found that, in fact, um, people really wanted a lot more information on logistics. They didn't know um, necessarily if there were planes available to use the, to, to uh, spread dispersants. Uh, they didn't know about the whether there were booms and skimmers sufficient for a big spell, that kind of thing. So logistics turned out to be a big uh, a key fa factor and often may uh, constrain what you're doing in response. And then we have response options here. So all the things that you can learn about um, dispersants, about mechanical options, about controlled burning, for example, of, and all the different, and what the characteristics of those options are, what factors you need to take into account for them to be effective, um, and then the impacts. And here's where, really where the focus of all that public concern was. Um, and previously, mo uh, the models had not really included much on human health consequences because the physical oceanographers and others involved didn't think that was relevant, right? So, and you still, even in this workshop in August 2012, there were a lot of people who weren't very interested in talking about human health consequences because it was more a hypothetical for them. Um, it just wasn't, it just wasn't the exposure that they thought would be necessary, and um, and they could show um, evidence for some of that. So human health um, uh, potential exposures. There have been um, some studies that have shown that in fact you do get people who are working on oil spill response who do get some exposures, for example, in certain contexts to um, to um, well, especially to oil, but to dispersants even. Um, and then um, e uh, ecological effects. Uh, the first study that we looked at, we were looking partic particularly at benthic effects, but this one we broadened that. Um, and then social and economic consequences. People care a lot about um, cultural. Um, assets and they care about whether or not their fisheries that they've been used to having for a long time, not only for economic reasons, but for cultural reasons, that it's part of their lifestyle, part of their community. They care about whether those are affected and whether the response option that you're choosing is going to influence the availability of those resources. Um, and then we looked also at what the response options, um, the contingencies of the response options here, for example, um, are, is, are, are the people available to respond and that kind of thing. Okay. So there's the model. The next step is to find out sort of where people are. And so this is, um, I'm going to move now to some of our recent research on um, public uh, thoughts and beliefs about the use of dispersants and other uh, response options on oil spills. So the first thing we did is we asked a couple of open-ended questions. Um, and I'll get into the details in a minute. But um, what comes to mind first when you think of using chemical dispersants to respond to marine oil spills? This is a public um, sample from coastal regions. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But what do you think it looks like? Well, I'll show you. <laughs> so this is a word cloud. I think you're all familiar with word clouds now. And um, <clears throat> well, not a very pretty picture. And I heard from our uh, lead PI, Ann Hayward, that Noah cried when they saw this. <laughs> they, they were not very happy. Um, there are a lot of response uh, spill scientists who think that dispersants are important and useful, and they didn't like seeing this at all. It's clearly very problematic. Um, and so you can see that the first thing that um, I've, I've circled here is nothing and I don't know. So even though there's a negative affective response, and you can do an, an analysis of that, 
um, the biggest response is that people say they don't know. Um, and then the next piece, biggest is a range of sort of negative affective responses to it. So let me tell you a little bit about the data collection. I'll show you a little bit more data. Um, this was a new uh, tool that has not been available for very long. It's through Google also. It's uh, called Google Consumer Insights. Um, and it's used primarily for marketing, right? So um, it's paywall intercept surveys. Um, internet users are given the option to answer questions instead of paying for premium content. And um, Google then uses algorithms to analyze internet protocol addresses to geolocate people and infer their demographics. So that means that at um, the sort of the community scale, you've got accurate demographics. You don't have accurate demographics for individual respondents. Um, they're, they're inferred. Um, and it's also um, Google can identify their IP addresses, actually, but they don't share that with us. So it's confidential and anonymous. Um, it's a validated sampling approach. Um, they've done some methodological research to show that, that with response, um, that they can get response rates and sampling er errors comparable um, to or better than those obtained with internet panels or telephone surveys. And they have a white paper on this that, sh that shows some studies that they did collaboratively with some of the groups that do this. So what they're claiming then is the results from this kind of an approach are comparable to what you would get from the kind of national representative sample that Tony Lazarowitz used in the earlier thing I showed you. And um, we um, surveyed not the entire nation, but we specified um, uh, coastal communities. Um, we could do that. We could identify zip code areas. Um, and we um, used all coastal communities in the US except those in the Great Lakes region. So this is the interactive part. So, um, so this, I don't know if any of you have seen these before. So I know some of you have. But um, these are um, measures of resilience, basically, that were developed by Hollings and colleagues a long time ago to look at people's attitudes or beliefs about ecosystem resilience. So they've been used very widely in the context of ecosystem resilience. Um, we adapted these to look at ocean ecosystem resilience. So the question asked people about um, their attitudes or beliefs about um, how resilient ocean ecosystems are. And these are the response options that they were given. And it goes from A, fragile. Oceans are delicately balanced. A few major oil spills will have catastrophic effects. So this is the ball teetering on the inverted curve. Um, B, gradual. Oceans are slow to change. Um, C, stable. Oceans are very stable. Major oil spills will have little to no effects. D, threshold. Oceans are stable within limits. Um, with a few oil spills, the oceans will return to a stable balance. Major oil spills will lead to dangerous effects. And then E, oceans are random and unpredictable. We do not know what will happen. OK, so I want you to do two things. First, what's your belief? Which of these is closest to your belief about the resilience of ocean ecosystems to major um, marine oil spills? And then second, what do you think is the modal response in the public? What do you think is the modal response in the public? So not scientists and people in an academic context, but the people reading the news online. Or Actually, they, they look at sports. There's all kinds of premium content they do. So it's sports, arts, news, you name it. It's not just news readers. OK, so now I want to see what your responses are. Um, and I want you to see what each other's responses are. So E, random. If you raise your hand. Two people, OK. Two. Uh, D, threshold. Oh my goodness, vast majority. OK. C, stable. One or two, OK. B, gradual, slow to change. Couple, three, four, a little bit more than the other. And then A, fragile. Wow. I am stunned. I actually didn't expect that. OK, so you guys saw what happened. OK, so here are the responses. A plurality, 33% overall, selected the threshold view of how ocean systems, ecosystems work. So they agree with you basically. Um, oceans are stable within limits. With a few oil spills, the oceans will return to a stable balance. Major oil spills will lead to dangerous effects. However, um, we also found that 26% had the view that ocean ecosystems are fragile. And this is way larger than we expected. So these are basically fragility with some resilience and fragility. Um, and this is uh, none of us, I think, would have predicted this. And so it suggests that people are. Um, not sanguine about polluting the ocean, in, um, at least with oil spills. We asked um, a number of other questions. So we had this pretty large set of questions that we asked. And by the way, that was answers from 14,000 people. So it's a pretty large sample and very stable. Um, and then there was, we did not find geographic differences. So we thought that we would find geographic differences and that the Gulf um, would be different than the other areas. And no, it wasn't the case. 
Um, okay, so um, we asked here in these questions, as you can see, I want you to focus on these bottom two. So they're the same question, basically. So 21, evaporated oil is broken down by sunlight, photooxidizes into um, environmentally safe compounds. Um, so 1,870 responses. And then this is from that August workshop that I talked about with the experts. We asked them to answer some of the same questions. Now, we were actually revising the survey instrument and getting their feedback on interpretability of the questions, on whether the questions were well-formed or not, that kind of thing. So some of the formatting in questions did change. Um, so in this one, they were actually asked on an agree-to-disagree scale. And I flipped the scale so that this is um, strongly disagree, and so it corresponds to false up here. Um, so that they match. And so uh, there's a couple of things that you can note about this. One, as, um, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? So just like we saw in the open-ended questions, what you see is the modal response is, I don't know. Um, now, most public opinions don't allow people to respond that they don't know um, because they want to force opinions because they're interested in things like voting. Um, but we are interested in people's understanding of scientific um, facts and processes around risk processes, and so uh, we asked them um, whether they thought they knew or not, and they say they don't know. Um, on the other hand, the experts all think they know something, but they know different things. <laughs> so, um, so you can see here that the modal response here, um, it, it, the tendency is in the same direction, but it's much stronger among the experts here. And in fact, I think the person who initially designed the question thought that it was, um, that in fact it was true. I don't know, though. Do you guys know? They didn't think it was true. I don't think so either. Anyway, well, the modal response here agrees. And so the point here is there's a huge amount of uncertainty, but we do see traction in terms of people um, uh, having some beliefs um, about facts that actually agree with uh, the experts. And the other point is that there is a lot of disagreement, even among experts, and that's partially because we had experts from a range of different fields. So they're going to have different kinds of expertise. Um, evaporation of oil is not going to be um, among the expertise packages among some, so it's problematic. Okay, um, so to sum summarize the results from the survey, many, uh, the majority were concerned about household economic impacts of major oil spills. We didn't expect that either. We thought that you know, maybe they would think it was unlikely, they wouldn't be worried about it, but we got a very strong signal in this regard. They perceive ocean ecosystems as fragile or near fragile, so to speak, with some resil resilience. They dislike dispersants, which they nearly half see as toxic and persistent. Um, they view response options other than mechanical as less effective than they've been shown to be. So this is one case where we saw a, few, a clear contradiction of um, what we knew from science and practice. Um, and when they, they see laboratory studies as predictive of the effects of oil and of controlled burning, but there's less confidence that scientists agree on the toxicity and effectiveness of dispersants. In fact, the scientists didn't think that scientists agree on the toxicity of dispersants either. <laughs> so uh, clear agreement on disagreement. <laughs> Um, and so, as you can see, uncertainty is pervasive. There's both aleatory uncertainty in this system because you have a lot of variability of all these different faint transport processes of the different uh, chemical processes going on, um, but also epistemic uncertainty. Um, people are uncertain. There's a lot of things we don't know, especially um, both within the scientific community as well as among coastal residents. Okay. So, um, so where does that leave us? Well, so in terms of decision making, what you can see from the pattern of responses that we got overall, that people tend to think about um, oil spills in the context of no response. They sort of think, oh, there's an oil spill or there's not an oil spill. And that's kind of how they like to, to do, they, that's their implicit sort of trade-off. But if you get them to think about dispersant use, then their sort of general framework or thinking about it is that you're using it in a pristine environment. So they're not thinking about the trade-off between having oil and using dispersants on the oil. They're thinking about having a pristine environment and then throwing dispersants into it. That's that kind of thing. And what, what we kind of, um, what we argue from the results is that there is a, a here an opportunity to inform people's decision making and perhaps influence um, their decision making one way or the other, I don't know how, um, by getting them to think about the trade-offs trade -offs that you're actually making in an oil spill response where you're thinking about either not responding or choosing between these um, portfolios of response options that include dispersants and mechanical cleanup. So, so providing information that would support that trade-off and encouraging a focus on that trade-off. So. <clears throat> So that brings me to um, the last very uh, small bit of the talk. Um, uh, so that's a, then that's on appraisal processes here. And so when we assess a decision-making context, um, and this happens on the order of milliseconds for any context, so I've been focusing on appraisal processes in the context of emergency response, but it's relevant for any decision um, context. Uh, the first thing that happens probably is that people have an affective response. Now you remember you saw the answers to those questions and people don't like dispersants. They have this quick affective response, it's bad. 
Um, they can, that's the fastest thing they can write bad, and they do. Um, so that happens, and this memory is set on the order of millis milliseconds. They also and, um, evaluate um, or appraise a number of other things when they're looking at a decision context, and this happens across all contexts. Anticipated effort of the situation, um, they focus, so this is how they're determining, um, how they're focusing their attention, so that intentional activity is part of their appraisal process. They think about the uncertainty or uncertainty, so there's an immediate appraisal of that. And then they focus very much on human agency um, and on situational control. Um, and this maps up very well to what we know about how people think about risk communication. They think about what they can do, right? Um, so um, let me give you an example of how uh, problematic this can be that, um, that I'm doing by analogy to the trade-off screen that I just showed you. So how much would you be willing to pay for this ice cream? Delicious vanilla ice cream. Nothing, right? <laughs> no. Okay, you guys, it's not too cold. Um, okay, um, so this is an experiment by Chris Shee, um, who's the guy here on the left. Um, and this um, work has been um, done, uh, there's been a lot of extensive similar work done by Melissa Finnecane and Paul Slovic, who are also showed there, on this whole range of studies on this. Um, so some subjects get this, some subjects get this, right? And they ask, how much are you willing to pay for this delicious vanilla ice cream? Right? Well, and then they give everybody this one. And what do you think happens? Well, so what they find is that the context frames the evaluation. Um, so people are willing to pay more for the overfilled 5-ounce container than they are for the underfilled 10-ounce container. And the overfilled smaller container is valued more until you put them by, side by side, in which case at least some people reverse their preferences. So this is a clear um, a activity pattern based on this attentional focus, and it has to do with what's easiest to evaluate and how it, easy it is to evaluate it. And it means you can get different results. People decide different things based on this, and it's based primarily on their affective response, which happens almost immediately. Um, so the, uh, Melissa Finnecane and Paul Slovic coined the term risk as feelings, and um, they showed that um, affect means the specific quality of goodness or badness is experienced as a feeling state, and they occur rapidly and automatically as part of this appraisal process. Um, there, as I said, there are lots of papers on this. It's problematic, though, even though it's extremely useful and it happens inherently all the time. Sometimes it's misleading. You can manipulate people with attractive names and images, background music, and affective takes. And there are certain aspects of our experiences that can um, cause shortcomings in our affective responses. So, for example, if something is seen as further away in time or in space, then we have a tendency to have a, less, um, a, a lesser affective response to it. So, um, so that brings us back to this um, appraisal process again. Um, one other aspect of this that I want to draw your attention to is this um, human agency and situational control. Um, we asked also, um, among our first open-ended questions that we asked of some people, what key information do you think should be in a booklet on oil spill response for it to be useful to you? And, well, <laughs> okay, so don't know um, is there again, but also we see a lot of what to do and how to help. People want to have actionable information that they can use. Um, now, I am short on time, um, and I don't want to run over. Can I take another few minutes? Is that Okay, so I want to summarize a few of the results from the rest of this project um, as well, because they also relate to actionable information. So Tom Lachine um, led some work on looking at the use of scenarios in spill preparedness and response. And he found that they're widely used in spill planning and response. Some of you may have seen the editorial in Science that came out about scenarios in oil spill response um, shortly after Deepwater um, by Marcia McNutt and Gary Macklis, is that right? And, um, but um, the practice of using these is constrained because the regulatory focus is on the volume, so like worst case discharges or maximum most probable discharges. And in risk, there's this term intensive risk versus extensive risk. And people tend to focus on intensive risk, so that's like the worst possible situation or the biggest possible risk, whereas extensive risk, which is um, a lot of smaller risks, are often the worst problem um, and much more common. So um, that could constrain the use of scenarios for this kind of thing and may be misleading. Um, further, while the focus on volumes promotes planning for response uh, needs and tac tactics, it may leave responders less well prepared for anticipating the causes, effects, or social conflicts about a response methods for things that are totally unexpected, those black swans like deep water horizon, um, because people's worst case scenarios don't go that far. Um, so uh, the, the point here is that fuller incorporation of stakeholder input in scenario development could help and uh, help remedy such shortcomings. 
Um, for those of you who might be tweeting, I don't see anybody tweeting a lot, but <laughs> um, Kate Starbird um, analyzes social media, and she's a new faculty member here at the UW, and she, um, she pulled a sample from the 693,409 oil spill tweets that, um, with that hashtag um, during deep water. Um, of those, 11,000 mentioned uh, dispersants. So it wasn't a big proportion, but it's still quite no, um, significant. And she pulled a sample from each, so some that mentioned dispersants and some that didn't. Um, and she found, for example, that dispersant-related tweets were more likely than other tweets to concern cleanup strategies and efficacy and also health impacts. So this, once again, we see this pairing of sort of how bad is it and what can we do about it. And 69% um, of oil spill tweets contained a URL, which is much higher than you usually see in tweets. Um, and this showed, and when you looked at, they went and did an analysis of what these URLs were and what they linked to, and they found that they're to science, basically. So people are yearning for scientific information and trying to make sense of it in the context, um, and they value and trust the voices of scientists. Um, they also looked at network analyses, and the, the takeaway here um, is that the Unified Command, which was the official um, com uh, response for Deepwater, was the fourth most retweeted, which is higher than I expected. So it means that they are actually, they were actually respected and listened to by a lot of people in the situation. But they also showed when you looked at locals, who also were influentials, um, that they were angry, they were afraid of environmental health effects, they wanted to do something, they wanted to contribute, and they were struggling to deal with conflicting information and high uncertainty, just like our survey respondents. And then um, kind of interesting is that the political bobble spirit, blob Blogosphere forms a secondary part of the oil spill conversation with some connection to the main conversation, but it's a little off on the side. And she has this beautiful graphic that she's done with Dharma Daily that shows us where the red part here is the um, political blogosphere. Um, the green is the locals, NGOs, media, and that's the core conversation. And then in the purple, you have media and activists, and in the blue, the celebrities and the media. So uh, it shows sort of what was going on and how these relate. Um, okay, so that product. Um, uh, we're still working on disseminating results. I got a bunch of scheduling notices today. Um, and, um, but we came up uh, with, under Bob Pavia's lead, with suggested practices uh, from this. Um, and that's to participate with digital volunteers to monitor. So use crowdsourcing to help with data collection, basically, because people want to do something, and this is something they can help with. Um, understand community risk perceptions. You can use internet and social media to do this in new ways. Um, outreach for communicating oil, fate, and transport. Uh, forecasts. People uh, need help with understanding the science, adapting scenarios to strengthen preparedness and structuring dialogues with communities to help them understand the science and, and uncertainty. So to wrap up, uh, one, two, three on proactive information strategies. We talked about the rapid rise of ocean acidification, especially in Washington State, um, and it's an example of what, when things go right, I think, and we'll see in the long run, but Washington State has certainly been in the lead and done a lot of the things that the, the research that I've reviewed with you here today suggests are right. Pulling people in, looking at how people think, trying to get involved with the user community, um, and working with the best science. A lot of UW scientists are um, in, in intrinsically involved in the processes of writing these reports. They're on the blue ribbon panels, they're running centers that are working on this. Um, does it errata for decision support? There's a clear structure that we can use, a research framework that involves decision analysis, um, that involves understanding um, how people think about these problems and how they make decisions about these problems, um, that involves the best ocean science. And then practical theories, I showed you an example in the context of, um, of dispersant use on oil spills. This comes from the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative. Are any of you aware of this? DOSI? Um, I heard a fantastic presentation on this this weekend by Lisa Levin from Scripps. And um, I, was, I was looking at her presentation like, well, I should just give her a presentation. It's so great. But um, they've developed an international effort, which is still um, starting, basically. But it's, um, they've been meeting for a while. And they had a, a pre-meeting survey of workshop participants that was international in 2013. And one of the things they asked in that survey um, was, what can we do? So this goes back to your proactive approaches question. And I want to bring you back to the point that the biggest slice of the pie here, and by the way, pie charts aren't, aren't very effective communication devices, um, is um, communication with science and stakeholders. So uh, communication is a really important strategy um, if you do it right. There is a lot of research on the details of how you design the messages. It's not just evaluative focus. It's how people understand numbers. It's how they think about uncertainty. It's how they interpret words, and it's how they um, process information in different formats. You can get detail. You can get empirical research on that in the social and behavioral sciences to help you. So to create actionable information, 
work with other scientists, interdisciplinary ocean sciences like yours, decision sciences and social and behavioral sciences, collaborate with decision makers, empirically test the messages as well as the models, um, and adapt or revise them accordingly. Consider participative research if you have the stomach for it. Um, I don't think scientists like to give up control of their research designs, but um, anyway. Uh, and be explicit about uncertainties. Uh, that uh, you need to test those with the help of behavioral scientists. We have um, one psychologist here on campus who's been doing some excellent work on communicating uncertainty. That's Susan Jocelyn in um, psychology, and um, hopefully we'll be doing more work that expands that to climate change context. And um, remember that sometimes better information sharpens, sharpens conflicts. In the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, um, they pointed out that the legal frameworks and the policy frameworks for governing the deep oceans are divided into two different parts, basically. Deep sea mining, which has a completely different framework and set of problems and goals than fisheries, which are the water column. And so there's a, a role for a lot of conflicts there. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sharman Haley from Alaska. My first question is, I have two questions. Um, the data analysis you did on responses, you know, community attitudes and stuff, do you have enough data to break out for Alaska? No. That's the same. Uh, my second question <laughs> is, a lot of the spill response exercises and scenarios are organized around the worst case scenario. And uh, there's a critique out there that using the work, worst case scenario raises the fear factor among stakeholders. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, actually, Tom would probably be better to comment, but I'll take the liberty. Um, so on the Alaska, um, we really hoped desperately that we could get um, a breakout in Alaska. And I asked um, Google if they could oversample in Alaska, but they said they couldn't oversample with the <coughs> strategy that they were using. Um, this was a, this is still being beta tested. That's why you're still using uh, just coastal communities. Yeah, coastal communities in Alaska. So so we tried to like 90% of Alaska. Yeah, I know, but it's a really sparsely populated state. So we got a total of 150 responses in Alaska. And what that means is we can say what those 150 and what the Alaska responses look like, but we have no confidence that they represent the rest of the state. So that's you know it's it's like talking to focus groups. So I guess I could present it, but I don't know. I'm not, I'm not so keen on the idea. I can't. I'm not confident in the results. Um, they are Google's developing their um, um, their capacity for this kind of research, and uh, but it's a function of how tolerant people are of answering questions, and people are not very tolerant of answering questions. So I don't know if they've got to the point where we could um, sample at that sub level and give a large enough sample to be confident of the results with the strategy. Um, this Tyler Scott has been working with me on some of this. Is trying to do that with Puget Sound Partnership. Um, to look at um, use a Google Consumer Insights survey in the Puget Sound area, so we'll see what happens there. Because that's even smaller, so I don't know. On the other question, I agree entirely that scenarios of worst-case events may potentially raise um, fear in um, people's minds, and and um, there's a couple problems with that. Um, one is one is that you may actually get people saying you're just crying wolf because. You're, like you're saying something really bad is going to happen and nothing happens for a long time. So why did we plan for this really huge scenario when nothing like this happens in our community? Um, so that's a potential problem. And the second is that um, there may not be as much they can do about that, and it may lead to the kinds of problems that Tom pointed out in his scenario paper, that you're not actually preparing for the, a worse enough scenario or for the smaller events that may be handled differently. So um, they're, they're, it's tragic on all fronts. Um, in the, New project we have on looking at Cascadia subjection zone events and, and um, events around them. We're looking at trying to do probabilistic scenarios. So we would actually then take into account a, a wide range of possibilities. Um, the first thing that we heard from somebody who's been working with um, communities on tsunami planning was that the state didn't like prob um, probabilistic products. And so I don't know if we'll get anywhere, but um, uh, the people have, there's this idea out there that people hate um, anything that has uncertainty information in it. And there is actually a lot of research um, by Ellen Peters and colleagues showing that simplified numerical information is really important. I have a whole other section of the talk that I cut out this on um, numeracy and how people understand numbers. And a lot of, about a quarter of the public are in numerate. 
Um, and you can't just solve it by using verbal probabilities. It doesn't. Um, verbal probabilities are very widely interpreted, um, so people may not mean the same thing when you say them. Uh, that's what the IPCC tried to do. It's not a good strategy. Um, so yeah, so um, so the complexity of the information. As soon as you add more information, you increase the complexity of the information potentially. You put the numbers in, that means people turn off their processing. They're like those people who are enumerate. So that's potentially. <coughs> And then on top of that, people can pick and choose what they focus on. So that attentional activity, um, there is, there's an old study by um, Kip Viscusi and um, Joel Huber that showed that when people, I don't know, I think it was Huber, but anyway, it was Viscusi and somebody else, and they, um, they gave people confidence balance on um, something that was like the pollution level at a site that they were going to cite something on. And what they found is about 10 to 20% of respondents only looked at the worst found, right? So. Now, Susan Jocelyn finds in her work, um, she's done a series of lab experiments on icing, and she finds that when people are given the uncertainty information, in the, in the aggregate, they make better decisions. They may, but then she adds the caveat that they may not necessarily understand that information. Um, I'm curious to dig into those kind of data because I suspect what she's getting is some people focusing on the lower bound, some people focusing on the upper bound, and some people focusing in the middle, and you're probably more likely to get people focused on the lower bound than on the upper bound for freezing conditions. So, it's a problem. We don't have a good solution yet. And if you could go back to the, um, the Cape's wonderful picture of the oh, yeah. broader horizons for a minute, I think it's uh, okay. precious, this interesting question about the uh, scenarios that are, could be addressed. Because what's interesting there is uh, who beat the command post, um, oh, yeah. which is the little sort of per uh, violet colored dot right in the middle of the 2010. So you have IDRRC, yeah. which looks like the big winner, International Bird Rescue and Rehabilitation. It's an organization that cared about wildlife. NWF, National Wildlife Federation. They were the big winners in the Deepwater Horizon spill. They put out a blog every day. They did nothing but give updates and express concern for the status of wildlife. That's what people cared about. And then, amusingly, who that 35? If you're, this is a woman who's, you think it's a woman who's a passionate blogger on everything, and she's local, or she wouldn't read that, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and we know she's a Saints fan, but uh, so uh, and that, that's the proof that, you know, a local person who's just there and already known is going to be influential, even though they may not know much about this. But the point about the scenarios now, it's not that bigger and scarier is the problem. It's the failure to define the scenarios in their true dimensions that are meaningful. Bird rescue, which came out of the Exxon Valdez spill, was a big thing. Both the natural resource scientists around the bend, that anybody would spend that amount of time and spend that amount of money doing that. You know, there was an article in Science Magazine, the title was $85,000 per sea otter. And that was the story about what it was like to yeah. rescue animals that mostly died. So the point there is that the scenarios is not that there is a still bigger, nastier spill, but rather it's the dimensionality in which the spill is really conceived of, and that's really important. So the business of engaging the public would hopefully enrich this thinking so that people are really, you know, they want the spill to kind of be defined in their terms, but that's not the terms the public sees it in. And giving them the broader model um, opens their eyes to what kind of causal processes there are in them. Other questions? Yes. You talked a lot about um, communication with the general public for the, or segments of the public. And I'm just curious about the work that's been done on connecting science with this. Pardon? Science with this. The natural resource managers, planners, and policy makers. Because that's where a lot of the science translation happens and where the science application occurs. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that a lot of that science communication isn't, is certainly not now informed by, it's informed by the broadest possible reading of this research, but think about numeracy or you know, perceptions of uncertainty yeah. because it, it's a Minor subset, and I'm wondering if you know of any research focused on that or any attention to that. So you, you probably wouldn't know as well as I do. Well, I don't know any. <laughs> no, there, there is some. There's definitely some. There's a um, whole bunch of research looking at, well, not a whole bunch. Okay, there's a little research looking at, uh, for example, um, modeling interactively with some policy makers and decision makers. I um, mean, those kind of like um, John Sturman's work. Um, 
about the models and that kind of thing. So working with simulations and models, and they're basically dynamic scenarios. Um, and um, we actually write about that a little bit in our white papers from this most well response project. Um, there's the, um, the picture is not completely perfect, but um, I'm trying to think of what conclusions I can draw from that research. Um, I tried to do some research um, with Congress at one point. We had this big project on health effects of climate change. And, um, I was told the EPA wouldn't fund the part that where we would go talk to staff or Congress people because that would be construed as lobbying. So, so I got the money and no project. Anyway, so it was a very weird situation. So there is, um, it is problematic trying to do research with federal, um, federally funded research from by an agency with Congress because of some of the lobbying laws. Um, but there is. There are some papers out there, um, and um, the stuff that I know of so far, it's um, there's not a huge decision makers and policymakers are closer to the public than they are to the scientists. Put that way. So I mean, they are our representatives. So that's that's what I know. I, I think personally that some of the examples that you see in the Washington State Ocean Acidification um, uh, seem look very promising. And, and be, just because it's interactive, you go in and you do this um, structured decision making. In fact, there's a book out on this by Robert Gregory, um, Tim McDaniels, and others, looking at structured decision making processes where you bring in um, a set of people, stakeholders, and decision makers, um, and then you um, have them meet iteratively with groups of scientists to work through a decision modeling of the problem. Uh, and then that can incorporate the science in a way that you couldn't otherwise incorporate because you have a chance to go back and ask the scientists questions. So most of that time, that process though, feeds them into the ultimate decision maker, and they aren't part of the group. They get the results of that process, so they get a, a, a matrix of criteria and um, decision factors that come from the science models, and, um, and then the weightings of the participants in terms of what they think would be the appropriate action. I'd be happy to talk with you more about it offline. I think we're just about out of time. Thank you all very much.